afternoon, and um, it's, I'd like to also begin by paying, well, celebrating Peter Hamilton's life and uh, um, that thinking which is there growing and which is the only answer that we have as uh, human beings to the tragedy of the rapid destruction of the planet, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, but I also want to talk about solutions. And I'd like to recognise the Indigenous people of Australia who have so, so much to offer if only the wider community has the ears to listen and the eyes to see in terms of living with the planet instead of off it. I've, uh, I've begun this little trip over on the Namoid Plains, the Liverpool Plains, south of Gunnedah, where there's a group of farmers blockading one of the world's biggest mining corporations, BHP Bullet Billiton, because they don't want them to come in and tunnel under their farmlands, which are some of the richest food producing lands on the face of the planet, without they know what impact that's going to have on the water systems. The Liverpool range is the water flows down on there, on the ground and underground, and it's absolutely central to this, this happy conjunction of rich soils, magnificent food, food producing, fertile soils and water. Uh, and this mining corporation, to get coal, wants to come and dig straight through under that and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And to cut a long story short, I will on behalf of the Greens move an amendment first moved by the independent member for New England um, in the lower house when the water bill for national management of the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin comes into the Senate in the coming week or two to insist that first of all be an independent scientific inquiry into the impact of putting massive tunnels under the little little lines on the water system. Because she said it's a simple question, which is more which is more valuable to us? Is it coal or is it blue? We know coal is rapidly wrecking our future through its impact on climate change. We also know that by mid-century, best estimates, there'll be 9 to 10 billion people on the planet all wanting to eat. And uh, let me put that in perspective. When I was a boy going to school in Armadale and Bellingen, there were 2.5 billion people on the planet. We're now at 6.7 billion, headed for 9 to 10 billion on most modern, modern, modest estimates. And if we get the five metre sea level rise that now is a fairly modest estimate by late of this century or next century, most of the biggest cities of 50 million people or more will be flooded to boot. And the estimates of 150 million people on the move by mid-century are going to look um, very, very frugal indeed. Now, one of the things about all this is how are we going to feed this human being? A month ago, when I was up there with 500 farmers objecting to a dam at Traveston Crossing, which the Bly government in Queensland wants to put through, and which is now on the table of the most powerful environmentalist in the country, Peter Garrett. And that dam, for a very small amount of water to go to Brisbane, which is a city almost devoid of water tanks. You know, you go through it and you look, where are they? Where are they collecting all this water that falls over this city, which is supposed to be short of water, and they're not there. But they want to put a dam on this little river to the north, which is the primary nursery for a number of rare and endangered species, including the Australian lungfish, Dara, the Aboriginal people, have known it as for centuries. And when you're out on a boat, and by the way, We've got our friend, the kayakist, arriving in Sydney today. He's kayaked all the way from uh, Brisbane to Sydney to try and raise awareness about this river. And um, you have to salute him. And I, and I heard it on the radio news coming up, and I thought, there's another person who's actually gone right out of his way, out of pocket, risked the oceans all the way down the coast here to make a statement about something people don't know about. And Dara, the lungfish, comes up behind you when you're not looking and you hear this sigh 
and look round, and there is one of these magnificent fish. And there, the species, there's six of them on the planet, and one of them's in Queensland, which came ashore out of the oceans millions of years ago, which I they brought up. Is it beyond the wit and wisdom of this nation, arguably the world's worst per capita polluter of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, to turn around? Let me give you some reliable figures on what we could do if we weren't obstructed by both the old parties under the thumb of the vested interests of the coal and the logging and the aluminium and the other big end of town industries like BHP which wants to mine under the Liverpool Plains. The Australian National University did a study a couple of months ago, came out with a study, which looked at logging of whole growth forests, forests and native woodlands in Australia. And what you may not know is not just a Tasmanian or Victorian or southern New South Wales problem, but on the Tiwi Island north of Darwin, they have in the last four years, while we've been asleep in our beds, logged 60,000 football fields in the area of those islands, stripped them bare and sent the wood off to um, countries to the north. It's a phenomenon which is gathering pace across the country. It's not slowly going away. And the study found that instead of there being 217 tonnes of pollution going into, carbon pollution going into the atmosphere per hectare, which is what the Greenhouse Office, the, the national experts have been saying was the case, on average three times that, 640 tonnes of greenhouse gases per hectare goes into the atmosphere. And when you get to the tall forests of the Sticks and Well Valley and East Gippsland in Tasmania, it's ten times worse. It's over 2,000 tonnes per hectare of poisonous, long-term, planet-dwindling and searing pollution going out of that human-led, chainsaw-led, firebombing afterwards process of clear-belling of our forests and woodlands in this country.